Well, now joining us here on A's Cast Live, the Director of Player Development, Stanford Zone, Ed Sprague, joins us here. Ed, it's great to have you on the program again. How are you? I'm good. Thanks, Chris. All right, so we were talking about it before you got on. We were talking about, okay, Ed Sprague's got World Series rings, obviously your great career, especially up in Toronto, but you also have a gold medal. And not a lot of people have a gold medal. Like, how proud are you of that? Where do you showcase it? Because not many people can go, yeah, I got a gold medal from the Olympics. Yeah, I mean, well, like, mine's right next to my wife's. She's got one, too. I'd, I'd say I'd, we're probably more <laughs> proud of hers than uh, mine. You know, very fortunate to be at the right time. You know, college junior, that's who got a chance to play in the Olympics that time uh, when I was playing. Didn't, didn't have professionals. So uh, very fortunate to play on, you know, three USA teams. And it just happened to be my year. You know, if I was a different class, I, you know, I probably would have missed it. So just very fortunate that was the case and got to play with a lot of great players. Well, think about your career in Toronto. You're playing for a country. In the Olympics, you're playing for your country. Just what is that like, the difference of, you know, whether you're playing, I don't know, San Diego, Boston, the other place you played in your career, versus when you're playing for your country? Just see, there's a, there's a, it's a different ball game. Oh, for sure. Yeah, when you put USA across your chest, it would, you know, it's, it means a whole something a lot different, you know, especially internationally. And like I said, I got to play in a lot of those competitions, and, and they were intense, and you get you come together with all the best players from – around the United States, it was, it was awesome. And then a very similar feeling in, in Toronto. I mean, right. Canada, the entire country was behind us and we'd never won before. So, uh, you know, that was a unique experience as well to have the entire, well, at least everything West of Toronto at the time, you know, probably was, was behind us. Everybody else was in Montreal at that time, but uh, it was, it was a fantastic experience, both of them really, but uh, you know, winning a gold medal for your country, um, celebrating with your with your you know friends that you've been with for a couple of years was was fantastic. I know everybody wants to hear about A's prospects. I get that. I just one more about your career because you had a great career and obviously it start you know from being from Stockton, going to Stanford, being a local guy. It, it was a terrific career. And you know for a team to finally get over the hump. I mean your guys' Blue Jay teams. You look at the Hall of Famers, all the All Stars, the great players. Those two years. But it was the Oakland A's that you finally had to get past. Just talk about how you guys had played against Oakland. They had their terrific players. They'd been to the World Series three straight years, one in 89. And it was you had to get over the hump of beating those guys for you guys then to become the best team in the American League. Yeah, the players that came before me in Toronto, you know, the Lloyd Mosby's, Jesse Barfield's, uh, Dave Steves, those guys like that. I mean, they really set the stage, you know, going from 85, 87, then 89 and coming so close. Uh, I was at the actually the 89 playoff game at the Coliseum, uh, you know, as just as a young minor leaguer watching that experience and watching basically Ricky Henderson take over that entire series and, and, and beat uh, Toronto. So, uh, yeah. And then, you know, you're going up against uh, Stu and Eckersley and, you know, it was, it was quite the team back then. And, uh, you know, they were certainly the powerhouse to beat to get to the world series. All right, so where the athletics are right now, obviously we're dealing with the day-to-day -day grind of the season, 10 and 39. It's pretty bleak. It is what it is. We can't sugarcoat it. But what we can do in a year like this is look to the future. And I think Ruiz has showed us right now on pace for 79 steals. When we were down at spring training, everybody's question was, is he going to be able to get on base? Well, forget getting on base. This kid not only gets on base, this kid not only steals bags, he's one of the best in the business at hitting with runners in scoring position. It's stories like this that give you hope. So when we come to you and we're talking about what you guys are dealing with in the minor leagues, what kind of positivity do you have as for us and young players that we're seeing in our system that are going to be the future A's to help us? Yeah, I think, you know, I think we have a lot of positive pieces. I think, you know, obviously when we went through this rebuild phase and made some trades, you know, everybody wants that immediate return. And, you know, some of the pieces we got back were young. Some of them were inexperienced pitchers that just needed to, to get healthy and get on the mound. Wow. Uh, we've had some, some good draft picks. I mean, Tyler Soderstrom, our first rounder from 2020, is in AAA right now. He had a great year last year. Uh, he's knocking on the door. Zach Geloff is right there. Uh, Brett Harris has kind of come on as a, a really uh, great little player, you know, kind of an everyday type guy, you know. And then, you know, Lawrence Butler, you saw glimpses of him in spring training. Uh, you know, he's got a chance to be, to be really good. And, you know, um, 
you know, Clark down there is, is off to a pretty good start. He slowed down a little bit, but you, you saw some glimpses of him as well. So there's some pieces coming. I think we're getting some pitchers healthy. Kusick's thrown really well. His last few outings, uh, Grant Holman just finished up his outing. He's going to get back out after an injury. Uh, so I think there's a lot of positives um, going down there. Obviously, you see Medina. He's pitching tonight. You know, he's he's had some 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 highlights there so far. So uh, hopefully get Miller back soon. And, you know, I think there's a lot of pieces to build on. They're kind of spread out a little bit throughout the system. You know, we're not all clumped in, in one area. Um, but I think that there's a balance of ages and position players and pitchers. You know, what we've seen with Medina is just a God-given ability to throw the baseball. I mean, it's an effortless – it's a very effortless athletic delivery. You can see what kind of athlete he is. And the one thing I don't think we've seen yet, because I've read about it, we've seen it at times, is just this incredible curveball that can just be a devastating Uncle Charlie. You know, what have you seen in him? Because we've seen glimpses – but it's at the big league level, and it hasn't really been fair either. It's like he gets called up for a debut, goes down, gets called up again. He really really hasn't had these consecutive starts to build on. Hopefully we're going to see that. But what have you seen in him that makes you think he, think he can be special? Yeah, obviously he's, he's got a power fastball. You know, and He came to us last year, and getting traded is difficult as a young player. Uh, and he was able to come over. Uh, he was a little erratic, you know, had a, a – trouble landing his heater in the zone and then going to his breaking ball. So really he was behind in count. So he's not throwing the breaking ball quite as much. Uh, so I think this year he kind of simplified his mechanics. He had a good winter ball. I think he really enjoys being on the mound. He's one of those guys that wants to pitch as often as possible and, and getting through that winter ball and, and healthy and, and throwing and competing over there for his country, I think was really good. And like I said, he's a, he's a unique competitor. He wants the ball all the time. So I think as more he gets comfortable, the more he gets comfortable with his release point, you're going to see him, you know, integrate those secondary pitches, his curveball and his changeup, um, and not rely so much on the power fastball. You know, when I think about your job and you got to concentrate on everything, but what is it like for you on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it triple A? Is it double A? Is it to what 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 right now would you say is the main focus for you? Well, right now I'm watching Lansing on my screen behind <laughs> over here. But, you know, I watch, uh, you know, watching four or five games a night. You know, we fortunate with uh, MILB TV. We get we can see a lot of the games. So I'm watching Oakland. I'm watching Vegas, you know, Midland, Lansing, Stockton, all the way down every single night, um, talking to the managers, getting game reports, uh, you know, getting an idea with players, talking to all our coordinators who are out and about. And, and of course, I, I travel myself to, to see all our affiliates. So it's um, – you know, it's busy on each individual night, but sometimes you're focusing on one player or, you know, if a guy's getting closer to maybe particularly moving a guy from one level to another, you're, you're maybe honing on that a little bit. It's amazing how much technology has changed your job just from a standpoint of, you know, it used to be years ago, uh, you weren't seeing the numbers from your minor league teams that until the next day. Now you're watching the games on television you can watch it on your phone you can watch it on your ipad you can see the players now there's data uh there's stat cast there's high speed cameras at all these different ballparks just talk about through the years how technology has helped you be more informed on a day-to-day -day basis yeah there's certainly a lot of information you know of course i got grady fuse on and of course keep lip and that uh, i replaced and uh, they tell you about how, how it was back then certainly uh, traveling around but yeah, we have a lot of information. Uh, we don't have to listen to game reports. All our game reports are typed in every night by our managers. Uh, we have all the statistics, like you said, which also helps us, too, from a coaching standpoint, too, because um, the players can't hide. You know, they can't they can't argue about not hustling down the line or making a good turn or getting a good jump on the ball in the outfield. There's no there's no hiding from that anymore. It's just it's black and white on paper. You can use those um, those numbers to help develop a guy's first step, you know, his range. Uh, his routes in the outfield, all those different types of things, we can use those to our advantage to help players continue to get better. Yeah, Grady Fuson can tell you that. He he had to go uphill both ways <laughs> in the snow to go to school. Don't buy it because I know Grady Fuson's hanging out there down at San Diego Country Club playing golf every single day. Life is good for Grady. Uh, when, when, when you're looking at a player, what is the key for you when you say, this guy, you call David Forrest, this guy's, and you say, this guy's ready. 
This, you know, now whether he's going to be called up or not, what what do you need to see? And it could be from Double A too, just not Triple A. Right. What do you need to see when you go, David? This guy's ready. Yeah, I mean, David sees the numbers. He he can see the numbers on paper. I think a lot of it, the insight he's looking for. We're looking for the maturity. You know, we're looking for the, you know, the character behind the player where he's at in his maturation process, you know, how he's bouncing back from a strikeout or how he responds to a home run, how he's handling himself in the clubhouse with his teammates. I think those are all intangibles that, that you're looking for to, when you're putting together a winning club. I mean, David can read the numbers just as easy as I can, and we know who's playing well at a certain given time. You know, we look at indicators that are going to uh, help us understand where he's going to have success at the next level. You know, I mean, if there's a lot of swing and miss, there's a lot of chase out of the zone, we understand those things are – are going to be problems if they're, you know, if they're throwing a lot of, from as a pitching standpoint, uh, you know, where they at with their strikes and their walks and, and, and their fastball command in the zone. Those are the things that we're paying a lot more attention to. So, you, you know, you see the, yeah, this guy, you know, he, he gave up no hits or whatever. We're, how is that going to translate to the next level? And a lot of times you got to look at the, some of the, the, the things behind the scenes in terms of just the box score. You know, when we were growing up, they talked about the Oriole way or the Dodger way. There's a way that this organization wants to play baseball. And it's like recently I've been hearing that again. And I we, 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 we had Grady on just not too long ago. And Grady talked about, hey, getting people to play the way we want Oakland A's to play. And they have done that for many years. Just how important is that? I don't know if it's corny to say the A's way to play baseball, but there is something that you want at every level to see the way the guys play, how they act as professionals, how they compete on the field. How important is that to establish that kind of mentality throughout the organization? Well, I think it's very important. You know, we want players to be successful when they get to the major league level. We want to produce winning major league players, not just players who get to the big leagues. There's, you know, the, in the grand scheme of things, getting to the big leagues is the easiest part. Staying there is, is much harder, right? Because they're the best in the game and they make quicker adjustments. And so you got to make sure you're prepared to do the little things that help win a ball game. And in the minor leagues, you know, a lot of, it's a lot about development. We still think winning is important, but you know, we're we're not going to take a guy out because he's over four, didn't move a runner over, didn't get a bunt down. We're going to teach him how to do those things. But when they get to the big league level, if there's a runner on second base and our guy hooks the ball to third. You know, my phone's ringing from Mark Kotze, and he's saying, what, this guy, you don't, you guys teach you guys to get a guy over or get a sack butt down or make a, you know, make a good turn. Or those are the type of things that, that we hear from on our side. And, you know, that's what he's expecting from player development to do is when these guys get to the major league level, they, the, the ability level is the ability level, but the intangibles about how to play a game and, you know, maybe not strike out with runner on third and less than two outs and putting the ball in play. Being able to take the extra base, um, you know, and and add that that extra ninety over the course of the game, those things add up. And I think that's organizationally that's what we want to do. Um, and I think everybody's on board with that. You know, for so many years, managers, the old school managers, they had no idea what was going on in the minor leagues. They may have seen guys at spring training. Mark Kotze is really he's, he's I know he's talked to minor leaguers, whether it be on Zoom calls or Google meets, whatever you guys use. He's talked to guys. Just how involved is he in the process of watching what's going on in, in the minor leagues? He's he's very engaged. Absolutely. He's very engaged. He, and that was from the get go in the minor, in the offseason when he went to Dominican uh, in spring training, when he came over and talked to all our players. Uh, when I'm in Oakland, uh, we have talks all the time. I know he's picked up the phone. When he's seen something odd on a report, whether it's a guy's uh, strength and conditioning effort, you know, in the weight room or whatever that looks like. So he's he'll pick up a phone and call call one of the players directly and talk to them just to reiterate uh, what we're trying to do down there. And that's that's been a big help for us. It's been awesome to have all of us on the same page. And, uh, yeah, he's he's not afraid to, to grill us a little bit, too, whether one of the coordinators come in and say, what's going on with this guy? What's going on with this guy? Let's get him right. So, um, no, it's been it's been good collaboration back and forth. And, and I talked to, to Cots probably once a week, once every 10 days, whether I'm in Oakland or not. Here's something that's baffling. And it's just so uh, we've talked to David Forrest about this on the David Forrest show about how do you really look at Las Vegas's numbers, knowing the environment, the environment, highly offensive and just horrific for pitchers. And I think of a guy like Kyle Muller, who now is being sent down and now the job is to get him right so he can come back up here and start again and win games. I, I don't know if there is a key. I, I 
what is it? What do you do when you, tr- you got to, it's just not physical. This game is so much mental. How do you get a guy right when you're sending him down to a, a place that it's not a good place to pitch? Yeah. I mean, obviously the numbers, you know, jump up a little bit, you know, on the offensive side and the pitching side, I mean, ERAs and stuff like that. So you got to look, like I said, some of those intangibles, first pitch strikes, the ability to land that second pitch. What are you throwing behind the count? What kind of, you know, quality of contact are you getting? I mean, sometimes you get, you know, less than ideal contact and it's a double or it's in the gap or it's a home run in Vegas. That's just the the nature of the beast. Now, offensively, that helps you quite a bit, right? So you get, you, you really get confidence from that and you can use that to your advantage. Um, you know, on the pitching side, it can be the opposite and, and deflate you a little bit. So you got to really work with that. I think it can make you mentally tougher, you know, if you can get through it and, and work through a lot of traffic. I mean, you're going to have traffic uh, in the Pacific Coast League. You just are. And so I think understanding how to, you know, work in traffic and, and having a lot of runners on base consistently, having the ability to throw that two-seamer down the way or that change up to get a ground ball double play to get out of it. I think those are the kind of little positives you have to look at as opposed to just looking at, oh, I gave up five runs and, you know, two homers that were jam shots. In 1996, in your prime at 28, you had 36 home runs. How many home runs would you hit in Vegas that year? Well, actually, I hit my first one in Vegas that year because they were building Mount Davis and we opened up. (laughs) (laughs) And it was a broken bat homer. So if you could think anything about leading to confidence, my first home run that year was a broken bat in in the old uh, Cashman Stadium. Oh, and, and, you know, let's end on this. Well, there's two things. Okay, Uh, one more on A's players. Who's the one player, and this may not be fair, but who's the one player that you're looking at and you're really excited you can't wait to see him be in an A's uniform? I mean, there's there's a lot of them. You know, I think I think you look at, you know, I think the, the bat of Soderstrom is obviously intriguing, the athleticism of Geloff, uh, the consistency of Harris. I'd say Harris because he's probably been the most underrated over the course of his time here, although I think he's starting to gain a lot of speed, but – uh, Lawrence Butler, I mean, just so exciting to watch play with his confidence. You know, when he's playing well, he's about as fun of a character in the big leagues that you're going to get. Uh, and then Denzel Clark, you know, when he's on, I mean, it's the power speed combo is is really special. You know, and he's going to come with some swing and miss. He's going to come with some flaws that because he just doesn't have a lot of experience playing. But the superior athleticism of him, I think, is, is those those guys on the offensive side obviously are. Are, are pretty special, um, you know, We each with their own unique personalities, I would say. But, you know, I think Law Dog has the most fun of them all right now. And so I think you saw that in spring training. So he'll be fun uh, addition to the locker room when he gets an opportunity. Now, obviously, you had a great big league career, but your family has been around minor league baseball. It's like been in your blood. Talk about your father, your guys' connection to the Stockton ports for all those years. Yeah, so I grew up, obviously, born in Castro Valley, grew up in Pleasanton, uh, moved up to Stockton halfway through my eighth grade year because my dad bought the ports in uh, the winter of 1979. And uh, that's what brought us up here. So, you know, I started, you know, as an eighth grade, ninth grader, I hung around there. I was the bat boy, clubhouse kid, uh, kind of did pretty much everything, cut bullpens as I got older, took ground balls and that's awesome. was part of the team. So, yeah, I was uh, a part of it. And then my stepmom bought the Lodi Dodgers in the Cal League at the same time. So, uh, yeah, it was a unique experience to be around minor league baseball and that. And then uh, my dad also had part of the El Paso Diablos when they were uh, in double-A Brewers. So getting the chance to go there and and see the unique Dudley Dome back in the day where they used to put up 35 runs in, in that ballpark. So, uh, yeah, I just I've been around it my whole, you know, my whole life. My dad uh, grew up. I mean, played in the big leagues. I was at the very first game of the Coliseum in 1968 as a one-year-old. And so I've uh, had plenty of uh, opportunities to be linked with the A's and then, of course, in press, professional baseball. Well, I know the story a little bit because I, I, I played at San Jose State and we played Pacific at Billy Hebert, where you guys own the team, which people got to realize it was a brick wall for the outfield. It was crazy in this park in Stockton. And I just remember the Sprague name because you were at the Blue Jays at the time. And I just remember everybody talking about how the Sprague's are involved and old Billy Hebert Stadium back in the day. Yeah, I mean, when I took the job at University of the Pacific, that's where was our field. So I spent in the first two years before we built uh, the stadium on campus was that we played our games at, at Billy Hebert Field, so over there in Oak Park. So it still exists today. It's a travel ball facility, and it's got a lot of history. 
Hey, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're busy, but a wealth of knowledge of everything going on, because we know in these dark times, the only way out, the light is the young players who are going to make us better. And you're training those guys. So very right. important to have you here on Ace Cast Live. We always appreciate you. Take care and let's do this again soon. All right, Chris. Thank you very much.